Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. A moving car is much more easy to steer than a stationary one. Now, if God wants to get you to share a testimony or a word out of the gospel to someone, you've got to already be on the move. You've got to be mobile. You've got to be available. You've got to be presenting yourself to God every day as a living sacrifice. When something exciting happens, what's your first response? Do you call your best friend to celebrate with you or head to social media so you can update your followers? When we've got happy news, we naturally want to share it. So then, why are we so often hesitant to share the good news of the gospel? Philip DeCourcy explores that question today on Know the Truth and challenges us to be more vocal about our faith. He's titled this message, Tell Someone, and we're in Acts chapter 8. A.T. Pearson once said, A light that does not shine, a germ that does not grow, a spring that does not flow, is no more an anomaly than a Christian who does not witness. You're an anomaly if you don't witness for Jesus Christ, because Christians are people who seek to make other people Christians. And that's why I want to come to Acts chapter 8, and we're in this study in the book of Acts, ready, steady, grow. We are struck by how quickly the Christian faith grew from its earliest days. And we're trying to do a little detective work here in the book of Acts. We're trying to discover what were the catalysts for their growth. As we come to Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 40, I think this story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, a model of personal evangelism, is a reminder to you and to me as followers of Jesus Christ that you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ. We trust His death in our behalf. We believe in His bodily resurrection, and we find the gift of eternal life through putting our faith where God put our sin. And the natural order is that having come to Jesus Christ, we turn around and we go and share Him with others that they might come to Jesus Christ. So let's pick up this idea here in Acts chapter 8. Let's look at this wonderful example of personal evangelism. The thing I want you to notice is Philip's adaptability. Look at verses 4 through 8. Then Philip, that's the Philip of Acts 6, went down to the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ to them. Now, notice these words, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. It's a preacher's dream. Everybody's listening to the sermon, hearing and seeing the miracles which he had done. For unclean spirits had cried with a loud voice, and had come out of many, and the paralyzed and the lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now, I then go down to verse 26. This is my first thought, his adaptability. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. This is the Philip who's speaking to many in the city of Samaria with great effect. I want you to leave there. I want you to arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert and he arose and went. He doesn't know that he's going to meet the Ethiopian eunuch when he goes, but he's flexible, adaptable. He just makes himself available. So there's his adaptability. Number two, here's his availability. It's kind of a piggybacking here. It's a two for one in that we're struck by the fact that Philip is willing to adopt to a new assignment from God. And here's the thing that strikes me, okay? Unlike me, he didn't sit down and go, but Lord, I'm making a citywide impact. I need to stand disciple. And you know what? This makes no sense. What do we read? So he arose and went. That's it. No excuses, no questions. You got to be challenged by this. He's in the middle of mass evangelism and citywide impact but all of a sudden he's on the road south from Jerusalem to Gaza. I see his adaptability and I see his availability. 
You need to have that intentionality because you see, God is in the people saving business. All right? Don't you believe that? I do. God's not willing that any should perish, but everyone should come to repentance. God is in the people saving business, and His method is His people. He's not going to get it done without you and me. All right? He didn't send the angels into the world to preach the gospel. He sent you and me. That's our assignment. It's a joy. We are just simply, as Spurgeon says, beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. And that's what God has called us to. We need to make ourselves available for that assignment. We need to have a gospel intentionality. Who will we send? Who will go? Isaiah, here am I, Lord. I'm available. I know I'm not the best, but I'm available. Use me. I'm undone. (laughs) I'm looking at my feet here. I am embarrassed to even address you, but if you will take me up, cleanse me, fill me, use me, where's the dotted line? I want to sign it. What about Romans 10, verses 14 to 15? Okay, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. People won't get saved unless we open our mouths like Philip and preach Jesus. Actually, it's very clear about that in verse 35, and Philip opened his mouth and preached Jesus. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But you'll notice verse 14, how then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? an evangelist, someone to share the gospel. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? But how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I hope you're available because there's someone in the office you work in, there's someone on your street, there's someone in your sphere of influence that God is preparing to hear the gospel, and He needs a mouthpiece. We should get our pole on our line and go fishing every day for people. And Philip makes himself available for that task. Which brings me finally to his appointment. His appointment. Let's go back to verse 27. So he arose and went. That's his availability. But here's the appointment. And behold. It's interesting. This little word behold is is important. You'll find it used by Luke in the book of Acts. For example, Acts 1 verse 10, Acts 10, 17, and Acts 12, 7. And when it's introduced into a verse or into the dialogue of the text, it always emphasizes something sudden. We don't want you to miss this. Behold. It often speaks of some providential occurrence. God's up to something that's emerging and evident. And that's what you've got here. Because this helps us, and it certainly helps Philip. He's shown adaptability, and he's shown availability. Remember, he, he went down this road not knowing what lay at the end of the road. But behold, here's what he encounters. He encounters a God-given appointment. Because when he gets down the road, he encounters a man of Ethiopia, not just any man, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. He was perhaps a Jewish proselyte and had come to Jerusalem to worship during Pentecost. Now he was returning. He was sitting in his chariot. And what a coincidence. He was reading Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the most evangelical prophets in all of the Old Testament. And it wasn't just reading Isaiah. Where was he reading? Scroll down to verse 32, the place in the Scripture which he read. And you'll see it's either in italics or a different typeset in your Bible. This is a direct quote. This is a direct quote from Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, numbered among the transgressors. It's the gospel, my friend. And it just happens that Philip meets him on the road, reading of all things, Isaiah 53. It's a setup. And I think it must have helped Philip. Because, you know, if he's human, he's going down that road and he's going, 
the city for the desert? The many? Good night. I mean, all I got out here is cacti and lizards. What in the world? And then all of a sudden, you know, he joins with a group of people, and you've got a man of significance. What a gospel opportunity. For one of a better way to put it, a soul served up on a silver platter. Or I like to put it like this, T-ball evangelism. This is T-ball evangelism. There he is, just sitting there, ready. He wants to know, is Isaiah speaking about himself or someone else? Someone, can someone explain this passage? This isn't coincidence. This is providence. And what is providence? It's the foreseeing. It's the care and guidance that God exercises over all of nature and over all of His creatures. Ephesians 1.11, God is working all things together according to His own will. Get this beautiful balance, by the way. And what God has joined, let no man pull asunder. You know, you've got this balance between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. So up until now, I've got human responsibility. You need to go south on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Okay, I'm going. Philip is fulfilling his responsibility. He's available. He's a glove for the hand of God to use. But when he comes down this road and he encounters this man, all of a sudden now we've gone from ground level to glory level, and we're seeing the sovereignty of God, that God has brought this about. In fact, it's interesting. I'm not going to die on this hill, but the word south in verse 26, is a Greek word mostly translated noon. It can either speak of a place south, or it can speak of a time noon. Now, if we were to read it like that, he's being sent down a road at a specific time noon, when most people aren't traveling. And if he was to go down this road during noon hour, when most people aren't traveling, and he encounters a chariot that's moving, that would draw his attention. God would bring about a timely encounter with a man intended for Philip to share the gospel with. It's just all sovereignty. The time, the place, God's at work. And you and I want to embrace that. Write down, divine appointments await us. Divine appointments await us. There are people in our circle of influence, in our sphere of life, that God intends us to share the gospel with. Everywhere, everyone, divine appointments await us. Philip soon discovered that before he spoke, right? He opens his mouth and preaches Jesus. Before he spoke, God had already been speaking through the prophet Isaiah. This man seems to be in a God fear, perhaps a, a convert to Judaism, perhaps a, a child of a Jewish parent, or had been proselytized to the Jewish faith. He has come to Pentecost. Certainly in the last lot of weeks, the buzz is, you know, something happened in Jerusalem. They crucified someone that claimed to be the Messiah. All kinds of things going on, and this man's caught up in it all, and he's ripe for the picking. I'm fascinated by that, and I'm struck by that. Let me say this, and we'll wrap it up. I want you to think about this idea of people in your life that are divine appointments for evangelism, that God has picked you out to share the gospel with them. Think about Acts 17. Just write these down. I'll read them for you. You've got Paul in Athens. You know, it's a kind of religious marketplace. They love to hear new things. And Paul's the latest thing you know, your Messiah was crucified. Isn't it true that cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree? This is absurd. And they say, but hey, you know, entertain us, Paul. And Paul begins to speak about judgment and Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And speaking to them in Acts 17, verses 24 to 26, he says this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by man's hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, listen to this, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Now, no, notice this. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God made everything, including our neighbors, our relatives, our workmates. 
He made everything, everyone. He doesn't need them. They need Him. He gives them the very breath they breathe. It's in Him they move and have their being. And He sets them down in certain places, streets, neighborhoods, cities, lands. And that's significant. That means that your neighbor lives where God put them. Your workmate, your friend. Now, notice what Paul goes on to say. This is where it touches on evangelism. The very next verse, he says this, God did this. Did what? Made everybody and everything and set them down and put boundaries around them and marked out the time of their life and the places they live. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him though he's not far from any of them. Listen to Rick O. Tyson, evangelist in England. In God's sovereignty, what is going on in history is that God is reaching out to people so that they will reach out for him. The reason your neighbor lives where she does is so that you will reach her for the gospel. Why did God want a Christian, you, to be in your workplace? Yes, so you can be a blessing to your boss and workers and work hard and honestly, yes, but also that they might hear the gospel. It's no accident that you know the people you do, and it's no accident that they cross your path. And you have a God-given duty and obligation to share the gospel with them because God put you on that street and put them on that street for a divine appointment. Let me tell you a story about friends of mine and Mark and Leslie Bundy and my daughter, Laura, the O'Neills who live in North Carolina, Pat and Tina, and they, they serve the Lord today. For many years, they actually were at the leadership level of CBMC, Christian Businessmen for Christ. And over dinner one night in North Carolina, Laura was with me. They talked about being stranded in Johannesburg. And they were on their way through Johannesburg. They'd been somewhere else in Africa, but like we've all experienced, they missed their connection. Not their fault, you know, no one real fault, just that this kind of stuff happens. Now, they're better than most of us, certainly better than me. They didn't get upset about it, all right? They just embraced it. This stuff happens. And then they wondered, you know what? If God is sovereign and all things work together for good, why are we here? There's got to be an appointment here in the midst of what seems accidental. So they come up with this question to themselves, what's the reason we're in South Africa? And so they decided over the next 24 hours while they waited for their connection to ask that question to anybody they had an opportunity to share it with. Even some of the employees at the hotel, they would ask them, are you the reason we're in South Africa? And they would kind of look at them, I don't know. (laughs) Am I? But the next day, they got up, and they went to a cafe for lunch just an hour or two before their flight, not far from the hotel on the way to the airport. And they were served by a beautiful, vivacious young waitress who served them well. And then as she left, the boss came in behind her as you and I experience at restaurants and say, I hope you're having a good dining experience. I hope our waitresses are serving you well. The food's everything you hoped it would be. And Pat and Tina, you know, certainly said it's been a wonderful experience. And then they popped the question, are you the reason we're in South Africa? And it led to a wonderful conversation where they actually shared the gospel with this owner of the cafe. Didn't lead to immediate faith, But there was a great conversation, and the gospel was clearly shared. The boss left, and the waitress came back, but this time there's tears streaming down her face. And she shared with the O'Neills that she was one of several waitresses and waiters in the cafe that were believers and were praying for the boss, that she'd come to faith in Jesus Christ. But they were also aware it's something we all navigate. How much can they share? They don't want to bug her. They don't want to annoy her. They work for her. Where's all of that balance? But the fact that God had sent someone to do the work for them and alongside them brought this woman to tears. And she thanked the O'Neills for sharing the gospel with the, the boss and prayed that indeed this woman would come to faith. Now, they had a reason, didn't they? for being stuck in Johannesburg between flights because there are divine appointments everywhere. 
Are you available? Are you alert? Do you live with gospel intentionality? Father, we thank you for our beginning study of Acts chapter 8. It's a wonderful story. Love the balance, Father. We see your stamp of approval on public exposition and the preaching and teaching of the Word of God to large groups of people where it's more of a monologue. But we thank you too for personal evangelism, which is more of a dialogue and uh, more personal, in many ways more effective, certainly part of the arsenal of weapons open to the church to grow through evangelism. And so, may we take a leaf out of the book of Acts. May we follow the example of Philip, who lived with gospel intentionality, who exercised his responsibility to share the gospel. Woe was me if I preach not the gospel. If we hide it, it's hidden from those that perish. But then encountered divine sovereignty. You're the greatest evangelist. Salvation's off the Lord. You open hearts. You open minds. You bring people to faith. And we thank you. You were working in the life of this Ethiopian. Lord, you, you've made everyone and everywhere. And you've, you've marked out their lives, the places, the times. You've set the boundaries. And you've done it so that they would seek you and find you. Lord, help us to look at our street differently. Help us to look at the cubicle in the office differently. Help us to even walking into a coffee shop or a fast food restaurant, think, is there an opportunity awaiting me to share the gospel? Help us to be ready. Help us not to doze, sleep, be inactive. This is the calling of all Christians. Help us always to go through life with our line on our pole, seeking to catch some fish. For Jesus' sake, amen. What a shift in perspective. Going through life, always ready to catch some fish. You're listening to Know the Truth with Pastor Philip DeCourcy. We're in a brand new study of Acts called Ready, Steady, Grow, and you can access previous messages at ktt.org. The online archive is completely free thanks to support from your fellow listeners. We're deeply grateful for all who have come together in support of this program financially to make Know the Truth possible. If you believe our world needs more bold, clear, and convicting Bible teaching, will you link arms with us by donating today? Whether it's $25, $50, or $100, it makes an eternal impact. And to express our gratitude for your partnership, we have a brand new resource we'd like to send you dealing with some pressing and timely topics. It's a book by Philip's good friend, Owen Strawn, titled Christianity and Wokeness. Now, this book cuts through the noise, offering a short but clear look at what the social justice movement is all about and how it differs from biblical justice. Philip calls this book a wake-up call to the dangers of wokeness and a summons to stand in opposition armed with gospel truths that alone set people free. We'd love to send you a copy so you can gain clarity in these important issues. Mention Christianity and Wokeness when you give by calling 888-644-8811. That's 888-644-8811. To give online, go to ktt.org. One last thing, if you're new to Know the Truth, we have a free booklet from Philip we'd like to send you when you get in touch for the first time. It's called Seven Days of Truth, Resting in God's Providence. Visit ktt.org to request your copy. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. So glad you joined us today. And be sure to come back for more bold biblical teaching from Philip DeCourcy next time on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.